Hello, 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 hello. This is Dr. Pete Mandick. Welcome back. This is Lecture 9, and we're going to be talking about empiricism. Empiricism is a view about epistemology, about knowledge, and in a lot of ways it's one of the most self-consciously scientific approaches to thinking about knowledge and philosophy. So anyway, let's get into it. We are in our epistemology unit, our last lecture, lecture eight, we we're talking about epistemology, and we're going to get into it a lot more deeply. The next few lectures, including this one, are going to be about empiricism, and then something that's kind of the opposite of empiricism, which is rationalism. We'll get to that in lecture 11. And then in the middle, something that in some ways is the opposite of both empiricism and rationalism, and that is skepticism. Empiricism and rationalism are both views about knowledge and what the sources of knowledge are, where skepticism is the view that there isn't any knowledge. That's a very, very simplistic way of putting it, but that conveys the gist. So we're going to be talking about these different views about knowledge, views about what the sources of knowledge are, views about how much knowledge there is, if there is any, and when we're thinking about all these different topics, I urge you to keep in mind this image. This is supposed to be a picture of a pendulum. You know, a pendulum is a thing that swings back and forth. And this metaphysical, sorry, metaphorical pendulum is illustrating a relationship in, between various ideas about epistemology as people's thoughts about these topics change over time. And we might see this as representing certain historical trends or just the way people, like an individual person, thinks about these topics. And I've arranged these ideas on a kind of a scale, and the pendulum is swinging back and forth from one end of the scale to the other. So all the way on one end, we've got skepticism, which is this, you might think of as a very harsh and severe view that says, no, we don't have any knowledge at all. You might think that's unacceptable, that we can't really live a life without assuming that we have some knowledge. So you might soften it up and say, well, maybe there is some knowledge. Well, if there is some knowledge, it has to have some sort of source. Maybe it's the way empiricists say it is. It's grounded in experience. So skeptics are very tough-minded. Empiricists they think of themselves as pretty tough-minded, too. They're just going to believe in the sorts of things that they can directly experience. So I can see or I can feel that I've got this water bottle, so I believe in the existence of that, or I might say I have knowledge of that. But other stuff that's remote from sensory experience, maybe I'm a little bit skeptical about that. So um, you might say, well, uh, empiricism is not really a stable position. If you're gonna, If you're going to be really strict, you are going to slide all the way back over to skepticism and say that there's no knowledge of anything. If you're going to start letting things in and allowing yourself to say that you have knowledge of things, maybe you're going to slide over in this other direction, which is rationalism, that we have knowledge of things beyond what can be given to our sensory experiences. But now there's a worry that you're going to slide all the way over to this other extreme, which sometimes gets called dogmatism. Dogmatism is kind of a pejorative term. I don't know if anyone calls themselves dogmatists. You get called a dogmatist by your enemies. And your enemies say, you believe in way too many things. You believe in more things than you really have knowledge of. So a dogmatist is someone who believes in things beyond what's given to reason. So you might say, that's bad. We don't want to do that. We don't want to catch ourselves just believing in stuff we don't have sufficient justification for. So we need to tighten things up. But the worry is that if you tighten things up too much, you're going to slide all the way back down to skepticism. You don't have any knowledge. So this pendulum is swinging back and forth from on the one end, you've got this extreme, which is skepticism. And on the other end, you've got this extreme, which is dogmatism. And if you recall Aristotle from our virtue ethics lecture, the virtue is a mean between two extremes. So maybe the virtuous place to be is somewhere in the middle. But is it going to be more empiricistic or is it going to be more rationalistic or is it going to be some combination of the two? And could you even combine empiricism and rationalism or does it got to be one versus the other? These are sorts of topics that hopefully will become clearer as we make it through these lectures. But let's get deeper into 
empiricism and come back to that pendulum later. A lot of the discussion, as I want to conduct it, is going to be taking us on a little miniature survey of 17th and 18th century philosophy as conducted in Europe on the European continent, which would include French and German philosophy, but also British philosophy from the 17th and 18th century. These have been hugely enormous philosophical periods, especially in European philosophy. And there's probably seven philosophers that are really considered to be most central in this era. And those are Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, and Kant. And some of these philosophers we've talked a bit about already. And each of these philosophers have made very important contributions to all the main areas in philosophy. We're just now going to be focusing on their contributions, however, to metaphysics and epistemology with an emphasis on epistemology. But metaphysics and epistemology for these thinkers really do interact pretty strongly. And one way we can see that they interact is in terms of these two questions about the relationship between metaphysics and epistemology. What is the mind? That's a metaphysical question. And uh, I've got it blue in blue. What is the mind? What is the nature of the mind? I've got metaphysics as blue. Such that it can know the world. So the world, that's metaphysical too. But knowledge, that's an epistemological topic. So what is the nature of the mind such that it, the mind, can know the world? But also, what is the nature of the world? So that's a metaphysical question. Such that it can be known by the mind. So there's this epistemological question about knowledge, but it's deeply connected to these two metaphysical questions about the mind and the world. What is the nature of the mind and what is the nature of the world such that the one can know the other, the one can be known by the other. You might say that if you give a certain kind of metaphysical picture of the mind and, the, and also the world, it's going to fall out of it that there's just no knowledge or not very much knowledge, or maybe you can't have knowledge of the external world. And if you want there to be knowledge of the external world, maybe you need to give a different kind of metaphysics about the mind and the world. Like maybe the world exists inside of the mind, and that way you can have knowledge of it, and there's no skeptical problems. Anyway, we're going to be interested in these questions about the relationship between metaphysics and epistemology, especially as viewed by the 17th and 18th century philosophers. Now, these philosophers often get organized into certain topical groups, one way of organizing them is to say that these three philosophers are rationalists, and we're going to study them in a later lecture. These three philosophers are empiricists, and we're going to study them in this lecture with a focus on David Hume. And then above and beyond the rationalists and the empiricists is Immanuel Kant, who is neither an, a rationalist nor an empiricist, but maybe a combination. He calls himself the transcendental idealist. Let's get into empiricism. What is empiricism supposed to be? One very simple way of putting empiricism is it's the view that knowledge is grounded in the senses. Knowledge is based in the senses. The most basic source of knowledge is sensory experience. Snip, snip. I had to do a little bit of editing there. But anyway, we were talking about the definition of empiricism. And so far, what I've said about the definition of empiricism is to give like the gist of the definition. But there's a very specific way of defining empiricism that's going to be very important for the remaining lectures. And that is as a claim about all knowledge. So it's not just saying like, oh yeah, senses or sensory experience is important. But it's saying that all knowledge comes through the senses, or all knowledge is grounded in the senses, or all knowledge can be defined in terms of material that comes in through the senses. One way we might put empiricism is not explicitly in terms of knowledge, but instead in terms of ideas or the contents of the mind. So we might say that according to empiricism, nothing is in the mind that isn't first in the senses. So you've got something in your mind, like right now I'm thinking about a purple guitar. Now behind me is a guitar, but it's not purple. But I've got the idea of a purple guitar, and so do you. Now, uh, how did that 
get in your mind the idea of a purple guitar. Well, you've got an idea of purple and you've got an idea of a guitar. How did those separate ideas get in there? Well, the idea of purple, you got it in part by looking in, at purple, seeing purple. And the idea of guitars is maybe from seeing or hearing guitars. And then you assembled the rest in your mind. But nonetheless, the ultimate source of these ideas, or the ultimate source of the parts of those ideas, is from the senses. Okay, so that is the gist of empiricism and also a more refined definition of empiricism. And let's now talk specifically about one particular empiricist, maybe the greatest empiricist, the philosopher David Hume. And we're going to start by talking about Hume's theory of ideas, a way of putting empiricism in terms of the nature of ideas, but this would also apply to knowledge too. And then um, we're going to move on to talk about three applications of Hume's theory of ideas, the self, causation, and induction, a kind of reasoning that's the opposite of deduction, called induction. These are topics that Hume raises problems for. He applies his empiricism and his empiricistic theory of ideas to these three topics and comes up with some very surprising conclusions. You might say the conclusions are so weird that this is actually a problem with empiricism, that it would lead you to these conclusions. There's a fourth topic that we could talk about that comes from Hume, but we're going to save it uh, for later. We're not going to get into it in lecture 9, but we're going to save it for lecture 19 when we get into our God unit, and we're going to see the way that Hume applies his empiricistic theory of ideas to the topic of miracles and whether you should believe in miracles. Um, spoiler alert, according to Hume, you should not believe in miracles. Okay, let's get into Hume's theory of ideas. Now, one of the most basic parts of his theory of ideas is to draw a distinction between simple ideas versus complex ideas. One way to think of complex ideas is these are ideas that have other ideas as parts. So take, for example, the idea of a unicorn. Just like a unicorn has parts, there's like the, the horse part and the horn part, and the horse has parts, there's the head and the, and the horse tail, so does the idea have parts. So you might say um, the idea of a horse is the idea of a hooved animal, an animal that has hooves and wears a saddle. And now that means that idea is a complex idea. It's made out of other ideas, like the idea of hooves. And the idea of hooves, maybe that has parts. And the parts of that idea would be the, the ideas you would use to define it. So if you wanted to try to give a definition of hooves, it might be something like uh, a hard um, nail-like growth on the bottom of certain mammals, feet. That's what a hoof is. And a horse has those. By definition, a horse has hooves. An animal that didn't have hooves wouldn't be a, a horse. So therefore, uh, the idea of a horse is a complex idea. It's got other ideas as parts. So if that's a complex idea, what's a simple idea? If a complex idea is an idea that has other ideas as parts, then a simple idea is an idea that has no parts that are themselves ideas. You might say these are ideas that don't have definitions. You cannot break them down into sub-ideas. Let's take, for example, the idea of red as opposed to the idea of the Japanese flag. So the Japanese flag is pictured right here, and that's a complex idea. And it's a complex idea because you could probably define the Japanese flag. You could probably explain to someone who has never seen the Japanese flag what it is. Even though they're not looking at the Japanese flag, you could tell them, well, you know, it's a, a white rectangle with a red circle in the center. It's a red circle on a white background of a rectangular flag. So even though they've never seen the flag before, they have 
these separate ideas of whiteness and redness and rectangularness and the idea of being a circle, and they can assemble those separate ideas in their mind and now know what a Japanese flag is, even though they haven't themselves seen a Japanese flag. They've seen circles and red things and white things and rectangles, and they can assemble those ideas in their mind to create the complex idea of the Japanese flag. And we might say, in describing the Japanese flag, we have given a definition of the Japanese flag. But how about the color red? Suppose there was someone who has never seen the color red. Maybe because they've never seen anything. They've been blind from birth and haven't seen anything at all. Could you define red for them? Would, would you be able to give a description of red such that, just like the person who's never seen the Japanese flag before, could know the Japanese flag based just on a description of it? Is there some description of red that would allow a blind person to know what red is, even though they've never ever seen red? I think a lot of people would say, there's no way, you can't define red. There's like a joke definition that you might give uh, that red is, um, red is, uh, <coughs> is yellowish purple. <laughs> red is yellowish purple, or, or red is purplish yellow. And I, you know, I think you might appreciate that that doesn't really quite capture it. Um, you might define purple as reddish blue or bluish red. That works. Um, and that's in part because we appreciate that you can get purple by mixing red and blue. But if you told someone that red is... that red is yellowish purple, or purplish yellow, someone who maybe has only seen purple and yellow before, but never read. Um, it's weird to think that red is made out of purple and yellow. You might say the only reason that is accurate at all that is because purple itself has got red in it. So if you see purple, you're already seeing some red, the red that's in the purple. Um, but that's not what we're after. We're after a scenario where someone has never seen any red, even red snuck in as in a sample of purple. They've never seen any version of red not even bluish red, no red whatsoever. Imagine someone who we'll talk about later in, the, in um, later on when we get to topics about consciousness and property dualism. We're going to talk about Mary, some uh, the a fictional character who is a super duper scientist who knows everything about vision and light and how the brain processes visual information. But she has spent her whole life in a black and white room and only has ever seen things in black and white. Could she know what it's like to see red, even though she's never seen red before? She's only read books about red. And the books were printed in black and white. So that's the sort of thing that we're after here, and I think a lot of people would see the plausibility of the claim that the idea of red is a simple idea. The idea of red can't be defined. The idea of red doesn't decompose into sub-ideas the way that the idea of a white rectangle decomposes into the idea of white and the idea of rectangle. So, um, question, where do we get the simple ideas from? Where did you get your idea of red? Well, here's a very plausible answer. You got it from having a sensory experience of red. You got it from seeing red. So that is supposed to now count in favor of empiricism. The empiricist says, aha, right, we have the best theory of where you get your simple ideas. <coughs> What's the alternative? That you're just born, born with it? You're born knowing it? If that's true, then people that are born knowing, having the idea of red, even people who are born blind and are blind their whole life. But if that's true, then if someone got their sight restored and saw red for the first time, then they wouldn't be surprised. They'd be like, oh yeah, right. Yeah, that's red. Um, so imagine this, someone who is, is blind from birth and they make it all the way to age 20 without having seen anything, including they've never seen red, they have heard that apples are red and blood is red and roses are red. They've never seen those things before. They've just been told that there's this word red that applies to those things. When they see, when they see blood for the first time or 
you know, after they're 20, we restore their sight and we show them an apple or a rose for the first time. Do they learn anything new? Do they, do they learn what it's like to see red? Well, if they learn something new, then it seems like they're gaining a new idea from their sensory experiences. However, if people are born with these ideas, then they wouldn't be learning anything new. They would already know, like, oh, yeah, right. You told me that roses were red, so now I know what it would be like to see a rose, and so I wouldn't be learning anything new when I saw it for the first time. So it's very plausible that, that there's certain ideas that we aren't born with, like the idea of red, that the only way we got them is through the senses, through our sensory experience. And the theory of ideas of Hume is to say that all ideas are either simple ideas or complex ideas. The simple ideas you get from your senses, and the complex ideas are assembled out of the simple ideas which you got from the senses. This is empiricism because now the source of all ideas is ultimately your sensory experiences. There are no ideas then that can't be defined in terms of your sensory experiences. And any so-called ideas that can't be so defined are just meaningless. They're just not real ideas. So let's take an example of one of these meaningless ideas. Take, for example, the idea of a colorless pink unicorn. Do you have a coherent concept of a colorless pink unicorn? Suppose someone said they join a new religion, and in the religion they worship a colorless pink unicorn. Well, an empiricist of the sort that David Hume is, an empiricist would say, you know what? Not only is there no colorless pink unicorn, but there couldn't be a colorless pink unicorn. In fact, there's no, you don't even have a coherent idea. You're just saying some words, but they don't mean anything. And if we think about the parts that are supposed to define a colorless pink unicorn, we see there's this massive contradiction. Uh, the unicorn is presumably pink, but pink is a color, so if something is pink, it can't be colorless, but by definition, we're talking about a colorless thing. So is it colorless or is it pink? It's got to, I mean, it can't be both. So this is incoherent. There's no way you could define this in terms of sensory experiences. You couldn't have a sensory experience of a thing that is both colorless and pink. It would have to be either colorless. How do you experience a colorless thing? Well, maybe you feel it or you smell it, you wouldn't see it. Uh, or uh, you can experience a pink thing, but you can't experience a colorless pink thing. So based on empiricist principles, we can rule out any justification in a belief in a colorless pink unicorn. And you might say, well, who cares? No one, no one really took seriously a colorless pink unicorn. But you could do a similar sort of thing with items that people have taken seriously. Many people have taken seriously a belief in God, a belief in an all-powerful creator. And one sort of empiricist might say, look, the idea of God just doesn't make any sense. God is supposedly a being that is outside of space and time, is the creator of everything, including space and time. But you can't have a sensory experience of something that's outside of space and time, so you can't have any idea of it. So when you say things like, praise be to God, or God exists, or God exists outside of space and time, you're saying things that are meaningless. It doesn't mean anything at all, and so therefore you shouldn't believe in them. You couldn't have any rational belief in those things. You couldn't even think about them. That's how bad it is, according to the empiricist. So the empiricist position about ideas gets used to rule out things as just a kind of nonsense or garbage. This sort of intellectual move, especially in the philosophy of Hume, gets referred to as Hume's fork. Hume says all knowledge or all ideas that are worth anything either are going to go on one branch of this two-pronged fork or the other, and then the rest of it is all garbage. So what are the two choices? Well, either we're talking about things that are grounded in experience, sensory experience, so things about observing the external world, that's knowledge that's worth having, or we are talking about the sorts of knowledge you get from combining ideas, knowledge that is grounded in the relationships between ideas. So um, the two points of this fork are what Hume would describe as knowledge that's grounded in matters of fact. So like the knowledge that we have when we know that all dogs are warm-blooded, that's a matter of fact. 
And then there's other knowledge that is grounded in relationships between ideas. Once you have certain relationships, once you have certain ideas, now the, those ideas enter into relationships with one another, some of which give rise to a priori knowledge, truths of definition, like the stuff you get out of math, the stuff you get out of logic. So all knowledge that's worth having is either relations of ideas or matters of fact. And anything else is just baloney. And that would include stuff like theology um, or maybe even big chunks of philosophy. So that's Hume's fork. And Hume is someone who you might describe as starting off with empiricism and then winding up with a very sort of skeptical philosophy. And this is the swing of the pendulum that I had mentioned earlier. So these are some Hume quotes. These are the words of David Hume. All the objects of human reason or inquiry may naturally be divided into two kinds, to wit, relations of ideas and matters of fact. Of the first kind are the sciences of geometry, algebra, and arithmetic, which are discoverable by the mere operation of thought. Matters of fact, which are the second object of human reason, are not ascertained in the same manner, nor is our evidence of their truth, however great, of a like nature with the foregoing. So there's two very different ways you would have knowledge. Knowledge through relations of ideas or knowledge through matters of fact. Knowledge through matters of fact are grounded in sensory experiences. Knowledge of relations of ideas has to do with an apprehension of the, the way the ideas relate to each other, but where the ideas come from is from the sensory experiences. So the sensory experiences are privileged in this sense, and they're the more basic. So then he takes this empiricism and he says, here's what you should do. Here's, you, here's what you should do with it. If we were to take in our hand any volume, that is any book, any book of divinity or school of metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. So he's saying that if you cannot take some alleged body of knowledge and define it in terms of his relations of ideas or matters of fact, then that's not really knowledge and you really should just put it in the garbage can or put it in the fireplace. It's worth relating Hume's ideas here to some earlier terminology. So way back in our early lectures we talked about a difference between a priori and a posteriori knowledge. And it's worth mentioning that, according to Hume, a posteriori knowledge is the same as synthetic knowledge. And a priori knowledge, so a priori knowledge is the same as analytic knowledge. So things that you know a priori are knowable a priori because they are analytic. That means they're true by definition. For example, triangles have three sides is something that you can know a priori. And it's also something that is true by definition. The very definition of a triangle is something that has three sides, and that's how you're able to know that a priori. That's how you're able to know that it's true just from your armchair. Uh, in contrast is something that you have to get up and go look out in the world and see if that's true. My glove is blue. How do you know that's true? you got to go look. You can't just think about the definition of glove and the definition of blue or the definition of things I owe, things I, that I own, and know whether it's true that my glove is blue. You'd have to have some sensory experiences, therefore it's a posteriori. That's supposed to be the same for Hume as being synthetic. If you study deeper into these topics and these philosophers, you get into, for example, Kant and the way that he thought there was such a thing as the synthetic a priori. But for Kant, there's nothing, or for Hume, there's nothing there. There's no such thing as synthetic a priori. There's just synthetic a posteriori and analytic a priori. So these little empty set symbols show that for Hume, there's nothing in these quadrants. All right, let's talk about the self. Let's take Hume's empiricist view about the relationship between simple ideas and complex ideas and the senses themselves and see what he does with the self. And just to give you the, the, the spoiler, uh, he can be interpreted as arguing there's no such thing as the self. And you might say, that's really weird. Like, that, does, that means I don't exist? I thought I was a self, and maybe there's other selves as well. 
Um, and on one interpretation of what Hume is saying, yeah, there's no such thing as the self. Some of you might be familiar with the movie Memento from almost 20 years ago. If you haven't seen it, it's a pretty cool movie. And you might describe this movie as depicting someone who, in losing their memory, they've lost themselves. They lost their self. They don't really know who they are, what their identity is. And they try to keep track of their identity by getting certain tattoos to remind them of who they are and what their goals in life are. But one thing to wonder, if it makes sense at all, that someone might lose their self, is could it be possible that you never had a self in the first place? What sorts of arguments could lead you to that conclusion? By the way, the idea that there is no self is very much a Buddhist idea as well as a Humean idea. And later on we're going to talk about Buddhist philosophy. But some of you might already be familiar with it and the idea that Buddhist philosophy rejects the existence of the self. And this idea of no self, that there is no such thing as a self, that you don't have a self, is very much in opposition to the rationalist philosophy of Descartes. That whole famous, I think, therefore I am, is part of a line of thought from Descartes for the existence of the self. Not only does the self exist, according to Descartes, but it's one of the things that he's the most certain of in the whole world. So that's an interesting debate in philosophy between the Humeans and the Cartesians about whether selves exist. They're not simply saying that selves, on the one hand, don't exist, and on the other that they do. But they're also saying, on, the, on this side, not only do selves exist, but we are more certain of the of the existence of selves than just about anything else. And on the other hand, you've got Hume saying, you know what, the very idea of the self doesn't even make any sense. It's not simply that it's not there, but you don't even understand what it would mean. It doesn't, it's not even a coherent idea. It is as bad as a colorless pink unicorn. How is Hume and also the Buddha led to this sort of thing, this sort of doctrine in terms of Say Buddhism, we might put as a rejection of any kind of permanent or static entity that underlies your constantly changing physical and mental attributes. So one way of getting at this idea that there is no self is to focus on how much we change. If you look for the self, aren't you looking for a thing that is constant over time? Um, well, what could it be then? then where would you look for it? Moving to Hume, Hume says, well, let's look on the inside. Because Hume is operating in a philosophical era that's very dominated by, for example, Cartesian views, whereby the most important or essential parts of a person is their mind. So if the self is anything, it's something like your mind or your consciousness. So if you want to investigate your mind or your consciousness, you have to look inside. You have to do introspection. This is also what the Buddha does when the Buddha meditates. The Buddha focuses his consciousness upon itself. So Hume does this. Hume says, okay, I'm going to look deep inside myself. I'm going to focus on my own mind and look for myself. And what do I find? All I find is a bunch of changing perceptions. So here's a quote from Hume. And do keep in mind that this is from the 1700s, so the language might strike you as a little bit archaic and also as having way more commas uh, than we would use nowadays. But here's Hume. For my part, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble upon some particular perception or other of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never catch myself at any time without a perception and never can observe anything but the perception. When my perceptions are removed for any time, as by sound sleep, so long I am insensible of myself and may truly be said not to exist. And were all my perceptions removed by death, and I could neither think, nor feel, nor see, nor love, nor hate, after the dissolution of my body, I should be entirely annihilated, nor do I conceive what is further requisite to make me a perfect non-entity. So we might interpret this in the following way. The alleged self is the thing that has perceptions. Perceptions of light, perceptions of anger, but when you go looking for this thing, all you find are the perceptions of light or the perceptions of anger. You don't find the thing itself. Now, if you're a good empiricist, you should only believe in things that you can sense. We might put Hume's argument 
side by side with an argument from Descartes. D Descartes has this discussion, and we'll talk about it again later. He says, one of the things I know as a rationalist is about substances. So take, for example, a piece of wax. Now, the wax has all sorts of properties that are given to the senses. It has a shape, and it has a smell, it has a color, and all those things change. I can melt it and change all those different sensible properties. But nonetheless, says Descartes, I know that there's something beyond those sensible properties, which is the substance of the, of the wax, something that exists even though I can't see it or hear it or smell it or taste it. And Hume is saying, no, look, let's start with empiricism. We start with the idea that the only things that exist are what you can sense, what you can taste and, and hear or feel or touch. And if that piece of wax changes in all of those properties, then there is nothing that is the piece of wax itself. Hume says there is no substance. There's just this bundle of properties, and the properties are changing. There is no thing itself aside from what's given to the senses, and they're always changing. That's true for the wax, but it's also true for you. So there isn't anything but the perceptions. There's not the thing that's having the perceptions. There is a sense of smell, but there's nothing that is sensing the smells. So therefore, there is no self. That's the way the argument is supposed to go. And the argument might remind you of something from the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus. Heraclitus says, everything has changed. Heraclitus held that everything is ultimately made out of fire because everything is constantly changing. And one little piece that we have left over from Heraclitus is this saying, you can never step into the same river twice. We talk about there being one river over time, but it's constantly changing. There is no one thing which really is the same river, so you can't step in it twice. You step into something, and then you try to step again, and it's a different thing. It's changed its shape, it's changed which molecules of H2O are there. So everything is constant flux and change, and there are no there are no permanent or lasting things, and specifically for the Humean or the Buddhist, there is no self. Now you might say, oh, that's pretty cool. That's great. I, okay, sounds really neat. I want to sign me up. I want to be an empiricist and then conclude that there is no self. Or you might say, following Descartes, get out of here. I mean, come on. Like, if I know anything, I know that I exist. And so if empiricism leads to the view that I don't exist, then goodbye empiricism. So you might say this stuff about the no self is a point against empiricism. Or you might instead say, yay, empiricism. Look at all the dumb things it helps us get rid of, like the self. We're going to see a similar sort of argument only applied to the very concept of causation. Causation, arguably, is a really important idea. We use it when we talk about things like, does human culture cause climate change? Does eating, <coughs> does eating foods that are high in gluten cause joint swelling? Does eating a low-carb diet cause a reduced frequency of obesity? Does smoking cigarettes cause cancer? What would cause me to become rich? If I major in philosophy, will that make me rich? <laughs> uh, well, it depends on if there's any causation, among other things. So causation is very important. We talk about causation all the time, and if you were having some kind of medical problems, you would hope your doctor could figure out what was causing it and, and hopefully change things up to cause you to become healthy. So what is causation? What is the idea of causation? Well, let's be good Humean empiricists. Remember the definition of empiricism that gets stated as there's nothing in the mind that isn't first in the senses. So one interpretation of that is if you have a coherent idea of causation, then there's something that can be given to the senses that would distinguish causation from things that aren't causation. Well, what does that mean, things that aren't causation? What's something that isn't causation? Well, coincidence. Coincidence is something that's not causation. Suppose someone, suppose someone wore a red hat and then went and bought a lottery ticket 
Yeah, and they got the winning lottery ticket. Did the red hat cause them to win the lottery? I think a lot of people would appreciate. No, it was just a coincidence. The red hat has no causal effect on whether you're going to win or not. It's merely a coincidence. So coincidence and causation are supposed to be two different things. But now if you're an empiricist, if there's a difference between causation and coincidence, if those ideas are different, there has to be something that could be given to the senses, to sensory experience, that would distinguish causation from coincidence. Imagine a world, in a world, with no causation. It would be a world that looks just like this one. Think of all the things that you think cause other things. So, for example, there's this chemical, this blue chemical, and this green chemical, and whatever you mix them together, later on there's an explosion. I think a lot of people would say, well, if you do it over and over again, and you get the explosion, that must be causation. Mixing the green and the blue chemical causes an explosion. But now imagine a world that's just like this one, except it's merely a coincidence that after the blue and the green are mixed, there's a explosion. What would this world, the coincidence world, look like? What would it sound like? Wouldn't it look and sound just like so-called causation world? I might mean, say, this is crazy. <laughs> and it is. It is crazy. And maybe empiricism is crazy. Maybe you might argue backwards and say, okay, look, we obviously have an idea of causation. And if empiricism can't tell us the difference between causation and coincidence, then to heck with empiricism. It should just go take a hike. But you might say, like, no, I mean, what else could the source of knowledge be besides the senses? Where else could our complex ideas come from besides our simple ideas? And where else could our simple ideas come from besides the senses themselves? So therefore, empiricism is correct, and all ideas must be definable in terms of what you could perceive. And so therefore, if we have a coherent idea of the difference between causation and mere coincidence, there has to be something we could experience in the world that would distinguish whether we were in a causation world or a coincidence world. But here's the problem. Any world you can imagine in which there's causation is a world in which the exact same things could just be happening by coincidence. And nothing you could see, nothing you could smell or taste would tell you it's causation. And you might say, yeah, but okay, look, what if I did it a thousand times? I mixed the chemicals a thousand times and every time there's an explosion. Wouldn't that be a causation world? Well, are you... But, couldn't that just be coincidence? It's just a coincidence a thousand times. Now, some people say, well, maybe the right interpretation of Hume is that there really is no difference between causation and these sorts of coincidences. There's nothing more to causation than a certain pattern of events, that some patterns, that there's some events that are related in time in a certain kind of pattern. There's nothing deeper to causation than these things that happen in a certain pattern. There is no general pattern that relates wearing red hats to wear, uh, winning the lottery, but there is this pattern that so far, or most of the time, the green and the blue is followed by an explosion, and that's all there is to, to causation. So that's one way to interpret Hume. Another way of interpreting Hume is to say there's just no such thing as causation, that the idea of causation is allegedly this thing that's separate from coincidence, but nothing in sensory experience would allow you to define that difference, so therefore this is as bad as a colorless green idea or a colorless pink unicorn. Okay, uh, next up we're going to talk about something called induction. Snip, 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 snip. There has been a little bit of some editing going on. But anyways, I'm back and I am back to talk about <clears throat> induction. What we're going to talk about is a kind of logical reasoning known as induction. And there's a famous problem of induction that Hume raises. So Hume is using his empiricism, his empiricistic theory of ideas, and criticizing various important concepts. He has criticized the self, he has criticized causation, and now we're going to see his critique of 
induction. But first, it helps to know what induction is, so let's talk a little bit about induction. Induction, or inductive logic, is one of three main kinds of logic. The three kinds of logic are what we'll call deduction, induction, or and um, abduction. Deduction, or deductive logic, is in some sense the purest form of logic. It's the strongest form of logic in the sense that in deductive logic you have arguments where the very best deductive arguments are such that the truth of the premises would guarantee the truth of the conclusion. And on the slide here I've got the word guarantee highlighted and that helps us contrast deductive logic with inductive logic where you're not guaranteeing the conclusion in an inductive argument. When you have an inductive argument, the best you can do is make the conclusion more probable. So an inductive argument is one where true premises make the conclusion more likely or more probable. And we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about this third kind of logic, which is abductive logic, logic that has to do with causes or explanations. When, But just to give a brief example, um, <clears throat> this is the sort of logic that is often used in, for example, a criminal investigation. When you have collected some evidence and then you're trying to reason to a conclusion based on what would explain that evidence, you find some footprints and you're wondering uh, who must have been there based on the footprints. <clears throat> You're drawing conclusions based on what would have caused those footprints. Well, somebody weighing a certain amount uh, would explain why the footprints had a certain depth. You can infer that the person was probably 250 pounds based on the fact that the footprints were in wet sand and six inches deep or something like that. So you're, you're drawing a conclusion that's specifically about the relationship of cause and effect, or what would explain the data. Abductive logic is very important in science, and it's important in criminal investigation. And here's a nice bit of trivia. Those of you who may have heard of Sherlock Holmes know that Sherlock Holmes is always saying that he's really into in uh, he's really into deduction. People ask him how he figured something out, and he says he did it by deduction. And almost always, it, it didn't. It wasn't deduction. He's really talking about abduction. And if you know logic, you find that part of Sherlock Holmes very annoying. Anyway, now you can be annoyed also. But let's talk more about induction and inductive logic, and because that's going to be the focus of Hume's critique. So here's a really, really simple form of inductive reasoning or inductive logic. It is an example of enumerative induction. So suppose there was a vase, you had good reason to believe there's lots and lots of marbles in this vase, and you, one by one, pick marbles out of the vase without looking inside the vase. You've got a pretty good idea there's lots and lots of marbles in there. You've also got a pretty good idea that the marbles are randomly distributed. You maybe saw or and or heard that a good the vase was given a good shake. They sh someone shook the vase, and you have good reason to believe the marbles are all mixed up, mixed around in there. And you reach in and you take out a marble, and it's a black marble. And you take out another marble, and it's black too. And you keep doing this till you've drawn out nine marbles. Now, would you conclude that when you pick a tenth marble out, that it will be black also? Would you expect it to be more likely to be black? If so, then what you're doing is inductive reasoning. But now we can ask the question, why? Why is inductive reasoning good reasoning? And you might say, isn't it just obvious that it's good reasoning? <laughs> but could you justify it? Could you give a justification for using inductive reasoning? That's the sort of question that Hume wants to ask. But let's talk more about inductive reasoning first. So I said uh, induction is a certain kind of argument, and, and you should know by now that arguments have premises and conclusions. So this argument that you're doing when you conclude based on nine 
marbles being black, that the 10th one will be black, something that we can symbolize like this. So we've got nine premises. I didn't write all nine because I'm lazy, but I think you get the idea that the first premise would be about the first marble and the second premise would be about the second marble and so on and so forth until you get up to nine premises. So you get to the ninth premise and it says the ninth marble was black and then we draw a conclusion and the conclusion is the tenth marble will be black. And we might have a slightly different conclusion if we wanted. We might say all the marbles are black. Um, that the, If there was eleventh and a twelfth and a thirteenth, just based on the first nine you might generalize to all the marbles. There's a sense in which you're making a bit of a leap. It's not absolutely guaranteed that the tenth marble would have to be black just because the first nine are. Nonetheless, it's very tempting to say, well, it's more likely that the tenth one is black. Contrast inductive reasoning that where you've got true premises that make a conclusion more likely without absolutely guaranteeing it to deductive reasoning. Here's an example of a deductive argument. Uh, premise one, Mandic has a vase and Mandic has nine marbles. So that premise is an and statement. It's got the word and in it, but we can make that bold. Mandic has a vase and Mandic has nine marbles, therefore Mandic has a vase. The conclusion is Mandic has a vase. And the premise is this and statement which has as its first part that Mandic has a vase. You might say this is so obvious you don't even know why anyone's talking about it. Like of course if Mandic has a vase and nine marbles it follows that he has a vase. But yeah that's right it follows and when we say it follows we say it follows logically. And in particular the logic by which it follows is deductive logic. So a lot of times logic might seem just obvious to you but that's the point. It's, it's a science of the obvious. It is spelling out what is absolutely certain based on certain premises. Given these premises, this conclusion just has to be true. There is no doubt that could arise about whether it's true. In contrast with the inductive case, there might be some doubt. Just because you've got nine doesn't guarantee that the, the rest of them are going to be black. Isn't, it's possible that there's a thousand marbles in this vase and only nine of them are black. The rest of them are all purple. And just by some weird coincidence, you got nine in a row that were black. That's possible. It's not impossible. So therefore, it's not necessary that the tenth one is black. Um, and on the other hand, if Mandic has a vase and Mandic has nine marbles, then it is necessary that Mandic has a vase. Here's some terminology that's important to know, and it will be on an exam or quiz at some point in this class. So when we're evaluating inductive arguments, the really good ones are the ones you would call inductively strong. In contrast, the deductive arguments are ones you would call deductively valid. <clears throat> what it means to say that a deductive argument is valid is to say that if the premises were all true, then the conclusion would have to be true. Maybe Mandic doesn't actually have a vase and nine marbles. Nonetheless, if if he had a vase and nine marbles, then it would follow that Mandic has a vase, so it's valid. Okay. Um, one other thing that's worth knowing in general about inductive arguments is that there are different amounts of inductive strength. One, one inductive argument can be more inductively strong than the other. So suppose you drew a conclusion about the next marble being black, or all the marbles being black, based on just observing nine of them. I'm going to change the conclusions here. I think it would be better with the same conclusions. The next marble, I'm just going to put, or all the marbles, all future marbles, all future marbles will be black. We'll put that as the conclusion for both of these arguments. I think that'll really make the point more strongly. Look at this. I'm editing while you watch. <coughs> Exciting. Okay, so the conclusion of both of these arguments is the same, but the arguments are slightly different, and they differ with respect to, number one, how many premises they have. Argument A has nine premises, 
and argument B has 90 premises. Argument B is based on more evidence. Suppose you observe 90 marbles in a row and each one of them is black, and then you conclude that all the marbles are black. Well, doesn't that seem like a stronger conclusion than if you observed only 9 of them? 9 out of 1,000 versus 90 out of 1,000? Some of you have taken statistics, and, and even those of you who haven't taken statistics might see like, yes, this makes total sense that argument B would be a stronger argument, and we might say it is inductively stronger than argument A. All right, so that is a little crash course in induction. Let's get back to Hume. What he, what's Hume's criticism of all this? What is Hume's problem with induction? Doesn't he like vases and marbles? Well, he says this thing about, like, well, how could you possibly justify induction? Could you give any reasonable or rational justification for it? We might put the question like this. Why is it reasonable to expect the future to resemble the past? So this is slightly different terminology than we've used so far, the future resembling the past. But if we go back to our example with the marbles, we can, we can see why the, this idea of resemblance between future and past applies. So we are talking about the marbles. We've observed the marbles, past tense, observed. We've observed nine marbles, but there's future marbles that we're going to observe, we haven't yet observed, and we conclude that they are also going to be black, so that is to conclude that the future will resemble the past. But how do you know that the future is going to resemble the past? Is there any guarantee that the future is going to resemble the past? Isn't it possible that the future doesn't resemble the past? Given that it's possible that the future doesn't resemble the past, I mean, it's not a deductive argument any, uh, anyway. It's not if it was, if if it was a deductive argument, then there would be a guarantee that the future would resemble the past. But we're not dealing with that. So why is it why is it a good form of reasoning? And you might say, well, it's a good form of reasoning because whenever we've reasoned this way in the past, it's worked out pretty well for ourselves. But here's a problem. You have just used induction to justify induction. You said, well, the first time I used induction, it was good. And the second time I used induction, it was good. And the third time I used it, it was good. And the ninth time I used it, it was good. So therefore, here on out, it's good. But you're just using induction to justify induction. But that is just circular. And it's hard to see that you could do any better than just give that crappy circular argument in favor of induction. So one way of interpreting Hume is to say that you can't really give any justification for induction. The, um, the, if, if you want to relate this to empiricism, what empiricism gives you is, in, is what's grounded in experience. And what's grounded in, in experience is what you have experienced. You haven't experienced the future yet. What knowledge can you have of the future, though? From an empiricist point of view, it looks like maybe you can't have any knowledge of the future. You just take a guess, but you've got no guarantee that your guess is anything but a leap of faith. Here's how Hume puts it. Um, well, this isn't a Hume quote, so it's not exactly how Hume puts it. This is more like the way I put it. So um, we could put it like this. If you answer the question, why is induction reasonable, with something like, because it gave true conclusions in the past and so can be expected to do so in the future, then what you're doing is engaging in purely circular reasoning. And I hope all of you know that plain old circular reasoning is bad reasoning. You're not really giving an answer to the question. <coughs> OK. So what are we supposed to do? Just not use induction anymore? Hume, what do you want from us? Now, you might say that, well, you've got to use it. I mean, what, what are you going to do? Not use it? Um, but it does give us a bit of uh, an unsatisfied feeling to find out that maybe there's no justification for it. That um, it, it's just a habit that we have and you can't say anything more in its favor. Then that's just the way we do it. We can't help but do it. All right, let's wrap this up. So we have looked at 
Hume's theory of ideas, which is all about complex and simple ideas. The complex ideas are made out of simple ideas. The simple ideas come from sensory experience. And all knowledge is grounded in, ultimately, sensory experience. And Hume takes these this kind of idea of ideas and applies it to these topics. We are going to leave miracles for lecture 19, but he applies it to the topics of the self and causation and induction. And one interpretation, a very strong and negative interpretation, is to say that Hume is telling us that the self, causation, and induction are meaningless. They're meaningless ideas. We can't really give a coherent definition of them in terms of what you could experience with the senses. And so they are just as bad as a colorless green idea, or they're just as bad as a colorless pink unicorn. So you might say then that Hume has illustrated for us this pendulum swing that I was talking about, where you might start with, say, some rationalism or dogmatism and become unsatisfied with it. Because people are talking about God, and they're talking about angels, and they're talking about metaphysical substances, and they're talking about what exists beyond what can be sensed. And you might say, this is just baloney. We've got to get rid of this. We've got to get something that's much more hard-headed and more scientific. So you're tempted to do something like empiricism, which tries to ground what we can know in terms of just good old ordinary sensory experience. I know that there's an orange rubber brain in my hand because I could see it. I could squeeze it and I feel that it's rubbery and there's no doubt about it. It's not something wacky like God and angels and free will and hey, forget all that stuff. Just good old-fashioned ordinary objects that you can see and, and feel. That's the sort of stuff we believe in. But what about other things that are really important like causation? Well, it turns out you can't have any knowledge of causation. What about induction? Well, for all you know, induction is garbage. It's going to start. It's going to start just failing us. Tomorrow, induction won't work anymore. For all you know, everything that we thought was was caused that was just a coincidence. And our medicines are going to stop working. Our machines are going to stop working. We didn't have any grasp of cause and effect. For all you know, there's just not even you. <laughs> you don't have a self. There's just there's just these things that you've been feeling and experiencing, and tomorrow you're going to feel and experience completely different things and behave in completely different ways. And there's no guarantee of any kind of continuity. There's no such thing as you. You think you know who you are, but you don't know anything. But that's a kind of skepticism now. So we started with a dogmatism, and we swung the pendulum all, all the way back to skepticism. And so you might say, like, well, skepticism is a bad, bad place to be, and if empiricism led us back to skepticism, then we shouldn't, we shouldn't look for our epistemological virtues in empiricism. Maybe we should take a better look or a harder look at rationalism and see if rationalism can do better as an epistemology. So anyways, in, in uh, the next couple of lectures, we're going to be looking at skepticism a little bit more deeply and, and rationalism a little bit more deeply. Let's turn now to the study questions. Study question number one. Which of the following is best defined as there is nothing in the mind that is not first in the senses? A. Rationalism. B. Dogmatism. C. Epistemologism. D. All of the above. E. None of the above. Question two. Hume's fork is the proposition that A, there's nothing in the mind that isn't first in the senses. B, all empiricists are either rationalists or dogmatists. C, all knowledge is either analytic or a priori. D, all ideas are either simple ideas or complex ideas. E, all the objects of human reason or inquiry may naturally be divided into two kinds, to wit, relations of ideas and matters of fact. Study question number three. The phrase, arguments where true premises make the conclusion more probable, is best seen as characterizing which kind of logic? A, bivalent logic, B, deductive logic, C, abductive logic, D, all of the above, E, none of the above. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, what you should be doing when you're watching these videos and being exposed to these study questions is thinking a little bit about what you think the answers to those questions are and see if you get the right answer on your own without looking at the cheat sheet 
But, oh, there's the cheat sheet. And what were the answers? E, 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 E all the way down. Just a world of E's. You might say, that's a lot of E, Mandic. What about the other letters? And I'm sorry, it's 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 E day. Um, and, wow, none of the above was the answer for question number one. How about... Uh, all the objects of human reason or inquiry may naturally be divided into two kinds. Does that remind you of a Hume quote? It should. That's a, a Hume quote. That is Hume's fork. And then, once again, none of the above. There you go. Those are some study questions for you. And that brings us to the end of Lecture 9, our discussion of experience, science, and empiricism. Until next time, I will see you later. Or, or smell you later, or hear you later, or something like that. Keep it empiricistic, or not. All right, bye-bye.